All right. Well, hello, everybody. We're trying something a little bit different tonight. We'll see how this goes. Very experimental. Uh, I'm going to try and do a little bit of a let's play kind of a thing here with Dark Souls 3. Um, I've never done this before, so I, uh, uh, you know, hopefully it goes okay. And hopefully it'll forgive my uh, amateur approach here and my amateur set up with my microphone just stuck on my couch here um then um this uh cheap camera uh capturing the footage so um we'll see so what i'm gonna try and do what my plan is is to start a new file of dark souls 3 as you see here and um i'm just gonna play through a little bit of it and talk about um uh about archaeology about the game about whatever sort of whatever comes to mind um, in this sort of classic let's play tradition, I suppose you might say. Uh, and um, uh, I've got some questions and ideas here that I gathered from some friends uh, and a couple of discords that I'm part of uh, and forums. Um, so uh, we'll see how long those can keep can keep me uh, keep me talking. And of course, kind of the fun of it will be uh, to see whether I can in fact actually, <laughs> play this notoriously very difficult video game while uh, talking at a somewhat constant clip uh, about archaeology. I think the answer will be yes, to give you a little bit of an idea uh, of my experience with this game. I, I have, I've platinumed it and I've, I've played it all the way through a, a number of times. Um, and um, and uh, that's not to say I'm some kind of special good hard butt gamer or whatever because I'm not uh, but I love these games and I've played them a lot so uh, and, and anybody who's 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 played through the Souls series will tell you that it's really more about uh, repetition and iterational learning than it is about some kind of inherent skill uh, and so that's true for me too I've probably played you know I don't know probably played this game for two or three hundred hours at this point and I'm just talking about three not the other games in the series um Dark Souls 3 is interesting. I know one of the first questions people often ask about your sort of choice in uh, in, in in the Soulsborne series is, um, you know, what's your favorite one? What did you start with? That could be kind of a fun place to start. So just talking a little bit about my um, my history with the series. And I, I did, um, you know, three videos about Dark Souls 1 uh, that you can go back and check out. And maybe I'll have a card up here for you to take you to some of those videos. Um, and I want you to, uh, you know, you know, check those out. Those are a little bit more like my like my more structured things. They're also the first videos I made, so they're, they're, the quality of them is a little bit rough. But, but they're fun, I think. Um, but a good place to sort of start is tell you a little bit about my history with the series. Um, I've been a fan of the series... You know, not not as long as lots of other folks. So I'm in some pretty nerdy communities on the internet where people have been playing from soft games since Kingsfield and uh, and even and earlier and and looking at these much older games. Uh, and um, um, and that's not true for me. I, the first I didn't actually play a Souls game until uh, I think until until Dark Souls Three was already out. Uh, but I played them in a really weird order, so they were suggested to me by a couple of people, uh, my brother-in-law and a and a good and a friend of mine from college. Both had been trying to get me to play the games for years, uh, and so I actually started with Dark Souls Two, and Dark, which is a weird place to start. And there's a story there that maybe I'll tell you later, but and that remains my favorite of the series. And I can talk your ear off about why I why it's my favorite, even though that is a a somewhat iconoclastic choice um uh, many people's least favorite game in the series but I, and I i love it but i actually think that dark souls 3 is the most fun game in the series to play and that's 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 putting it slightly above bloodborne which is saying something i just think in the moment to moment play of dark souls 3 i don't think it's the strongest game story wise settings wise themes wise i think it's it's not the best game in the series it's still a fantastic one of the greatest games ever but um it's it's weaker than a lot of those other um, um games in the series in those other ways but in sort of moment to moment just fun and challenge i love it so here we're gonna let's let's make our character so first of all if you've watched my other videos you know my dark souls character is always always 
named Janet. Janet's my girl. So we're going to make... Uh, yes. Ooh, yes. So we're going to make... You know, so Janet... Uh, sure ages you. I'm not going to spend a ton of time here on the character creation screen, although sometimes I like to. Class, we're not going to go with Knight. I, I kind of want to do like a dex build. I haven't done a dex build in Dark Souls 3 in a very long time. I, 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 I almost always do strength builds. I love strength builds. I love ultra great swords. Um, that's my favorite way to play. So what's the best dex class in 3, if I can remember? The assassin, I have to start with a do I want to be like a like a hard butt and play as a depraved? Deprived, rather? Uh, not really. Um, I could do a thief or an assassin. I don't really want to use an S-Doc, but I'll start with it. I don't really want to play with a with a pokey weapon, but we're gonna we're gonna start with it. What's the mercenary's decks like? Oh, the mercenary. Oh, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna we're gonna start with the mercenary, burial gift. Uh, take the young white branch. Uh, yeah, like I said, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time with this with the face stuff. Uh, um, did that? Age, sure. Yeah, that's fine. Physique, uh, that's fine. Let's make her buff. Uh, build detail, I'm not gonna get into that. Base, I'm not gonna get into that. Skin count, I'm not gonna make. Bum, 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 bum. Oh, you know what I could do? Hold on, I've got some defaults here. I've got some I've got some favorites. Maybe I'll just steal one of my favorites. Oh, these all suck. <laughs> I don't know. Um, where's my... Where's my hair color? I just wanna change my hair color. Does not matter. None of this matters. Face details in here. Yeah, that's what I want. I just want to change my hair color. And my hair type. So, so as I was saying, Dark Souls 2 is actually my favorite. Um, my favorite uh, in the series. And um, I love that game. And, uh, and I think it has the strongest theming and the strongest story of any of the games. We're going to do that. We're just going to whatever. This is fine. Beautiful. Doesn't matter. Um, but Dark Souls 3, as I was saying, I think is the most fun to play moment to moment. And it's and it's it's become my it's become my relaxation game. So to be honest, it's the beginning of the semester. A little bit of a stressful time. Uh, I uh, just finished a huge, the huge project that was the Uncharted video. If, if you haven't watched that yet, please check it out. Uh, that, that took me about... 80 hours start to finish to finish that project uh so you know i come back to the souls games because i actually find them uh quite relaxing and so that's what we're gonna that's what we're gonna um what we're gonna do um all right let me we're actually gonna strip a lot of this stuff off we're gonna dump the shield we don't play with shields no shields no shields oh i get two I don't think I knew that. Okay. Cool. Alright. So, I have not played a Souls game in a, a little bit. So there, I just get owned in my first... And like I said, I haven't played a dex build in a really long time. So, I'm going to be a little rusty. Oh, it feels so good, though. So, I mean, just still a gorgeous game. So I'm playing this for the first time on the PS5. Uh, I managed to purchase a PS5 a few months back. That was after, oh, about two months of trying. It was a really, really um, long and, and arduous uh, process for me to um, to buy this, this darn PS5. But I finally managed it. Isn't there a guy over here? Oh, no, that's in the uh, other one. Oh, boy. Oh boy, I am rusty, aren't I? Um, ow! Stop it! I'm gonna, I'm gonna die. Oh, of course, my dog is barking. I'm gonna have to go let my dog in. So I should switch to talking about archaeology now, huh? Like you guys don't really care about this stuff. So, but we're playing it on the PS5. Oh, I'm gonna die! Oh my god! So this is my. Can I in fact do this while, uh, while, uh, 
trying to talk and the answer apparently is not really um make sure this is still recording um but we're gonna try it anyway i guess i should do this one um so anyway uh, ultimately the point was to talk about archaeology so I'm going to do that. So I have a bunch of kind of questions and, uh, uh, you know, prompts that people suggested maybe that I talk about. Um, the first came actually from the, uh, from, from the Archeo Gaming Discord. Very cool place, by the way, um, with a bunch of nerds that are interested in this very specific intersection of things, archaeology and video games, uh, which is not necessarily the most common <laughs> intersection in the world. And yet there is this really cool little... Uh, sub-discipline emerging called Archeo Gaming. And Archeo Gaming is a lot of different things. It's not just... In fact, it's mostly... And I don't even know if I consider what I'm doing to be a, a, immediately a, a part of Archeo Gaming. Um, in, because... Well, that was a kind of a bullshit second attempt. Um, what? Uh, because, um, you know, archaeogamy is really more about the study of the intersection of these two things, archaeology and gaming. And I am really using archeo our, uh, video games as a, as a teaching tool, right? This is more of a pedagogical sort of thing that I'm doing here, right? I'm using video games as an avenue to, to talk about archaeology and to learn about it and to teach about it and to think about it in new ways. Whereas I would say that most, most, um, well, that was fun, um, most uh, archeo gaming folks are are actually really analyzing video games as archaeologists. It's a very different thing. Um, let's see. Wait, do you jump with you jump with the? I missed. Oh, it's nothing out there anyway. That's in the, again in the sort of dark version of this. Spoilers. Um, and um, so they're looking at you know uh, um, it, in some ways it's about archaeological representation so so archaeo gaming can be a a uh, a study of um what uh how archaeologists are represented in video games how um uh, archaeological settings are represented in video games a little bit of what i was doing in the uncharted video very recently right um uh, but it can also be about um, the representation of ancient peoples, about issues of identity and race and gender in video games viewed through an archaeological lens or using archaeological method or theory. And then it can also be a much more direct example of archaeology in video games, which is where, you know, the sort of prototypical example of this is like you go and, uh, you know, go into an old WoW server and you... Uh, um, uh, and, you, and you sort of, you know, that's been abandoned for five years or something. And you look at the way that it was sort of built by people and interpreted by people. And that's really cool, too. All right, so here's going to be my first real serious test here. Can I, in fact, do a boss battle <laughs> while talking about these things? Uh, and this is a tough one. So of all the uh, openings... Um, to a, to Souls games, they always open with a boss battle in the very beginning, uh, and um, Dark Souls 3's I think is definitely the most challenging. Do I have? Uh, let's put those on there. Um. Ooh. Oh, ow! All right, so. I'm not actually talking. Oh. Oh. <laughs> All right, I guess I'll just maybe I'll just focus on the fight for a second. This is the part that's going to feel more like a let's play. Oh god, I haven't done this in a while. I'm so rusty. I only get 3 flasks. Christ. I am definitely going to die. Um, <laughs> anyway, so if you're here, you probably think archaeology is kind of cool already. One of the things that the, I started to say as the suggestion that I got from the, uh, the Archeo Gaming Discord uh, was actually to just do a little bit of, you know, talk about archaeology and why it's cool and why, uh, 
why why people are interested in it. You're just doing a little bit of public outreach, if you will. And so, um, I you know I don't know if I need to necessarily talk to you about that so much because you guys are here. You're probably already interested. I mean, I'm not going to use those uh, those uh, fire bombs here because this is. I'm definitely going to die. Yeah, I'm just going to let that happen. We're just going to let that happen. I'm going to try this again. <sighs> Super rusty. Um, so why is archaeology cool? Why is it interesting? Why is it important? That's a more important question. Why is it important? You already know why it's cool, right? You're here. You think this is an interesting um, uh, discussion to be had. You probably already... How do I get... Okay. Um, you probably already think archaeology is cool. But do you know why it's important? Why is it, you know, something more meaningful? Um, something with a little bit more uh, uh, density to it? And I think that's because of the way archaeology um, can, be, uh, can be a real uh, service science to a lot of communities. Um, it can help communities understand and build uh, their own heritage, sometimes in cases where uh, that's that's maybe um, um, uh, in the distant past and can be a little bit hard to to reimagine and recreate. Um, it, uh, uh, it 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 allows for um, you know we call sort of stakeholders or descendant communities to to build a stake in their own history and their own past by participating in archaeology. Not something that archaeology has always done very well, but in more recent years has started to do better. Um, ooh, ow. Oh man, I am. Oh my god, am I gonna die twice this? I think it's because I'm fighting this guy a little bit like I am using uh, an Ultra Great Sword. I need to like swing more. Um, <laughs> see, this is the real test is can I actually do this without losing my concentration? And the answer is no, apparently. There we go. Oh, he's just going to go hard in me. Um, whoa, I don't remember that move. What? Okay. <laughs> so... Um, let me move on to some of the other, uh, some of the other ideas, um, uh, that did come up. Somebody had the question, this really builds off of my last video, my video, um, uh, about Uncharted. And in my video about Uncharted that I just released, and again, check that out if you haven't had a chance to do so yet. Um, uh, I was talking about archaeological method. So mostly I was talking about sort of how and why archaeologists dig sites and how we actually go about doing that. So we're doing that through the lens of talking about taphonomy and preservation. And uh, taphonomy, of course, being site formation processes, how our sites actually formed and made, and uh, preservation, which is how the objects in archaeological sites sort of come to be in, um, in situ, in context, when we excavate them. And, um, uh, and so somebody asked me the question, I thought was a really good one, was if, they'd, if I would explain to them the the ethics of when and why we dig. And I thought this was a really interesting thing to sort of tackle and not something that necessarily a lot of people would know about. Um, and it's really, uh, so what they mean by that is, um, you know, why don't we leave sites in the ground? Wouldn't it be better to not dig them at all? And I'll start by saying that uh, certainly a lot of, there are a fair number of people who really think that most of the time that is the case. We should just, we should keep sites in the ground and we shouldn't dig them unless we absolutely have to. Uh, and then others who feel like it's, you know, there's more, there's more leeway in that. And there are times when it's okay to do purely academic digs. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I find myself somewhere in the middle on this, of this argument, but my feelings on it are not particularly important. Uh, I'm just doing so little damage. <laughs> I'm so used to my big fuck off swords. <laughs> I should, I should, I should heal here. Yeah, it's not even gonna fill me, so that's fine. Um, uh, now I'm focusing on the fight. Oh, 
Really? Ooh, sorry, I'm, uh, I'm distracting myself with the fact that I've think of it actually. Win finally. I guess I should do what you're supposed to do, which is use the items. Oh, ow. This is what I get for trying to, trying to do it right. I'm going to be honest, I don't usually actually use the firebombs. Oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> that was close. <laughs> anyway, we did it. Okay, so back to the ethics of why and when we dig. So this is a surprisingly complicated question. Why and when do we dig? Do we, uh, uh, is it better to simply leave sites in the ground? Well, maybe. Like I said, there are some people, some archaeologists who believe that, that we should really only excavate sites in the absolute uh, direst of situations, right? So most of the time we should simply leave sites in the ground. Um, uh, the exception to this being when sites are imminently going to be destroyed. Uh, so I'll tell you that to start with, that's actually how almost all sites in the, in the U.S. at least are excavated. Most archaeological sites in the U.S. are excavated um, because they're about to be demolished, because they're about to be destroyed by a construction project. Usually, um, uh, usually um, um, projects um, uh, of, uh, of infrastructure, uh, that are infrastructure in nature. So this is about to become uh, a super relevant uh, debate in a way that it hasn't been for a little while um, because it's looking like um, Congress is probably going to pass a pretty large infrastructure bill. And that money is going to pour a lot of money into, uh, that bill is going to pour a lot of money into state and local governments and federal and federal uh, uh, projects to do things like build highways and build um, um, and build uh, uh, gas pipelines and electrical lines and all kinds of stuff. And when those things happen, when those projects happen, they disturb the soil and archaeological sites get destroyed. So there are um, a set of laws in the books called Section 106. Now, I don't pretend to be an expert in this. I'm not, uh, although I've had to take classes about it in, in graduate school and stuff. So I know a little bit about it. And I've worked in this industry before. So I know about it from that perspective. But I don't, uh, I'm, not an, I'm not an expert on Section 106 law, on archaeology law. But the Section 106 laws are supposed to protect cultural heritage sites. So what this does is it creates a whole industry. Um, if you're familiar with sort of environmental, the industry of environmental protection, I'm not actually going to fight the Uchikatana guy. He's up there. That's going. I'm going to leave him there. I don't I actually, I don't want to mess with that. Um, he's just going to kill me. If I had an ultra great sword, I could beat him. Um, but that's besides the point. So. Section 106 laws are designed to protect cultural heritage. Uh, and so this whole industry emerges in like the 1970s and 1980s, mostly driven originally by graduate students at big universities. So the big, the big firms up here in, uh, in the Northeast, in the Southern New England where I work, um, uh, emerged out of universities like the University of Connecticut, uh, which is where I got my PhD, uh, the UMass, UMass Amherst, uh, Brown University. Um, basically, graduate students kind of got together from these places, looked at these laws, and realized there was a money-making opportunity for them there. And so they, uh, uh, they started firms, and these firms are called Cultural Resource Management Firms, CRM uh, for short. And they employ um, mostly archaeologists, but also historians and other experts and specialists uh, who, um, 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 who, who, who work on these projects to help protect historical heritage. So what that means is that, let's say you're gonna, uh, a pipeline's going to get built across the state of Massachusetts. So, you know, it's a 200-mile-long pipeline. Um, the, uh, the company gets federal funding for that or state funding or some combination of the two, and part of that law says you have to protect cultural heritage um, sites that might um, or or excavate and study them if they're going to be destroyed by your project. So they hire a CRM firm. CRM firm comes in and they do archaeology and they recover as many sites as they possibly can from that region 
And they, I realize I'm just running around Firelink Shrine here while I talk, but that's okay. Um, uh, and and they and they uh, uh, and they they collect as much data about those sites as they can, and then the sites are destroyed. That's how like I don't know what the figure is. 99% of archaeology in the United States is actually done. So that sort of answers that ethical concern right from the beginning. That's uh, that is in some ways the most ethical. Um, approach in those cases because those sites are going to be destroyed and and we learn at least something about them through the CRM process. But what about academic archaeology, which is the kind of archaeology that I do now. Like I said, I've worked in CRM in my life. I've worked for museums and I've worked for CRM firms and I've done that kind of work before. Um, uh, but um, what about what about purely academic archaeology? What about uh, the kind of archaeology I do now where I just go dig up a site that is not threatened at all? Is that ethical? Hold on, I'm going to go let my dog in. Come on, come on. Are you going to come join me? Are you going to come hang out? Let's see. Oh, oh, you're all wet. Oh my goodness. You're soaking wet. Excuse me. Um, I don't know, we'll, we'll, see if, uh, we'll see if my dog pops into the pops into the image at some point. You might see him. If he comes sits on the couch, what he usually does, um, you might see him. Um, so, um, uh, all right, so we're going to talk to this lady. Blah, blah, blah. I'm a firekeeper. Um, so CRM archaeology, uh, excuse me, academic archaeology is when we're going to dig a site that's not threatened. Is that ethical? I don't have, a, I don't have an easy and straightforward answer for that question. I don't, I really don't. Oops. Um, uh, what... Uh, um, should we leave those sites in the ground? I don't know. That's a little bit of a debated question. I think most archaeologists would say it is okay to do academic archaeology if we we stand to learn something new and meaningful. If there's a sort of valuable scholarly contribution that's going to come from that excavation, then it's okay to do it. Uh, uh, and so that's that's the kind of archaeology that tends to get done um, in um, um, in academic settings. So we avoid the kind of thing that, you know, separates us theoretically from treasure hunters or something, uh, which is like we're just going to go dig up stuff in people's backyards because we want to find treasure or we want to sell stuff on eBay or whatever. We're not going to do that as archaeologists. There has to be some meaningful scholarly academic contribution that we can gain from excavating a site in an academic manner. So that's the kind of ethical concern that also introduces us to these two different types of archaeology, CRM and academic archaeology, which is, I think, what I'll talk about next. But... Let's let's play the game for a second. So I gotta I gotta do some leveling up here. I'm not gonna think about it too hard. Uh, let's throw a little bit in. I'm just gonna throw it all into vigor. Let's just you know I, I need to get, give me a little bit of, give me a little bit of HP. Not think about it too much. Blah blah blah. Farewell, Ash one. So this is Firelink Shrine. One of the things I'm gonna talk about in a future video. I'd frankly like to do a whole video about this. And this was again also. Uh, a couple of my friends on the uh, the the Goblin Bunker Discord. We should check out if you if you if you feel so inclined. Um, a couple of my friends on there had some really great ideas, and another and one of those was to talk about um, some representation of time depth in Dark Souls 3. And I know that's something I talked about a little bit in my Dark Souls videos from Dark Souls 1, but it's really obvious in Dark Souls 3. Right, one of the things they were trying to do in this game um, was Oh, you get the cells for Twin Blades. That's interesting. Um, one of the things they were clearly trying to do in this game was um, to um, was to connect was to was to make you think about Dark Souls One and to make you think about time depth and what are called palimpsests. Palimpsest is a really cool word. Talk about a cool cocktail party word. A palimpsest is. Um, when things are built at atop each other and they become intermingled uh, in a way that makes them difficult to to disentangle, and this is the this is the essence of a lot of archaeology. A lot of archaeology is trying to deal with and understand palimpsests. I'm getting to, I'm getting too into talking about this this stuff, and I'm not playing the game. I'm supposed to be doing both. That's the challenge. Blah blah blah. Let's see. Is there anything I want from this lady? Purchase item. Anything I can even afford from this lady? I don't really want a bow. Uh, doesn't she have, she has that keys, 20,000, that's way too much. I could just cheat to get up there. I'll do that later. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to make you sit here and watch me do that, do the trick where you cheat to jump onto the, uh, to, 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 to get around using that key. Alright, um, let's just go, let's, let's play the game. Let's just get, let's just move. Travel, we want to go to the high wall of Lothric. Let's do it. 
So if you're following along with the story of the game, you've probably played this game if you're watching this, um, but let's say you're not. We don't have a whole lot of story yet. Uh, I'm, I'm this lady. They call me the Unkindled. I, I woke up in a grave, so I guess I was dead. Uh, I go and I fight a big dude in armor with a, with a big old halberd. Uh, he kicked my ass a couple of times, and then I finally beat him. Uh, this creepy lady uh, makes me stronger with souls, and then uh, they send me off to the High Wall of Lothric to do something. Don't worry about it. The story will come later. But for now, we're just going to sort of enjoy this world. We'll get a little bit into the High Wall of Lothric and then probably quit for this evening, this first video. And then maybe we'll go from there. If people are interested, if people want to see more of this, I'll happily do it. If people aren't interested and they don't want to see more of this, then I won't. This is very experimental, right? I'm, this is a brand new channel. I'm trying different things out, having some fun with it. Different ways that we can kind of have fun, play a game together, and uh, and use that time to to learn learn a little bit about archaeology. So like I said, the next thing I was going to talk about was, um, oh, I was talking about palimpsest, right? So a palimpsest is any time you, uh, you, uh, you have uh, this sort of intermingled components of your archaeological site that are hard to disentangle. So the st we're going we're gonna to learn with time that the storyline of uh, Dark Souls 3 is that a huge amount of time has passed since the events of Dark Souls 1. This is the same world as that. This is actually a sequel to Dark Souls 1 and Dark Souls 2. Um, and all this time has passed. And a lot of things have happened during that, uh, that, that intervening time. There's been all kinds of like rising and falling of kingdoms and uh, uh, complicated changes and things have degraded. And obviously we're in this sort of post-apocalyptic looking world here with zombies and whatever. Um, so uh, the game presents a kind of a palimpsest in that we're going to, as we go through the game, and this is going to be much more um, obvious later in the game. It really isn't um, visible here early in the game, but later in the game it's going to be really obvious that this is, uh, that this is the case. Uh, and we're going to start to see direct references to uh, Dark Souls 1 and to especially 1. And they're going to border on the difference between, I mean, just true, like, homage in the sense that they don't really um, add a lot to the story, maybe. Or that's, 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 the game has been accused of that. People who don't like this game have accused it of that. Um, um, and, um, uh, but uh, they also are going to, again, if you go back and check out my recent Art and Charted video, they are lying to us in a very big way way um they're lying to us about you know i'm not being crazy about collecting all the treasures or whatever we're just we're just moving here i'm gonna get the important stuff um i want to i want to move through the levels and have some fun uh and not spend hours trying to get every little thing um uh, oh i can't kick with this weapon oh that's a pain in the ass uh <laughs> um um uh, and so they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna play really fast and loose with that in uh, in in Dark Souls three uh, this this sort of telling lies thing that I was talking about in the Uncharted video they're going to uh, they're gonna really they're gonna really cheat with that I, there's a shortcut here that I can take I don't need to mess around with all this we'll do this we're gonna piss off this dragon and then we're gonna run we're gonna fucking run we're just the language and we're gonna let him murder everybody for us. Isn't that nice? Wasn't that nice? But then we also need to uh, make sure we don't get caught in the fire. So they're gonna really play fast and loose with these lies because in this in this game, unlike an Uncharted, where you're talking about a oh maybe a few hundred years have passed. Supposedly, I mean, thousands of years, millions. Of, I don't know. We don't know. Untold amounts of time. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, amounts of time have passed since um, uh, since the events of Dark Souls 1 and 2, and yet things are going to just sort of appear in this world. Now, this is a fantasy world, right, unlike Uncharted, which is supposed to represent the real world. So maybe we can forgive it a little bit more. Do I want to fight this guy? Do I want to... Do I want to... Again, I don't have a way to kick, which is kind of a pain. Oh, I probably don't want to... You know what I want to do? Oh, I'm so... Oh, I'm almost stuck. We're gonna go and secure. We're gonna go secure the bag, by which I mean we're gonna go and grab the. Uh, we're gonna grab the fire that's up here. 
Oh, oh no, they're not gonna let me do that because I'm in a fight. Oh yeah, I guess he gave up on me. So we'll do that. I wonder if I could summon people. I could put down my summoning sign. That could be kind of fun. We could go help other people while I while I BS. Let's keep going forward. We can play around with that later. Um. Uh, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, they're gonna play fat very fast and loose with that. So the, so uh, what I was talking about the Uncharted video that lies. This game is like the literal worst with that. But we can forgive it a bit more because it's a fantasy world. Um, next thing that I was going to talk about, I was I just introduced you to the idea of CRM archaeology and academic archaeology. So let me tell you a little bit more about the difference between those things because this is a part of archaeology that I find a lot of people really don't know about. And it's such an important part of our, I mean, even my students, people who are, who are sort of like on their way to being anthropology majors and archaeology majors don't necessarily understand how important this breakdown is of, of private versus uh, academic archaeology. The mass majority of archaeologists in the United States are, in fact, um, CRM archaeologists. They work for private archaeology firms. They do not, um, they do not work for universities the way that I do. Um, this guy's got a lot of health. I'm so, like I said, I'm so used to playing with like big strength weapons. So academic archaeology really is uh, the minority. It's, uh, that's going to be unlocked. Um, it's me, it's, it's other people who work for, for universities, people who work for research institutions. Maybe you can count uh, folks who work for sort of museums. And, uh, and then there's the public sector. There are archaeologists who work literally for the federal government, the National Park Service, for states. There are state historic preservation officers. There are, there are state archaeologists. There are community archaeologists. The city of Boston has a city archaeologist, and so do uh, some other cities that have important, you know, that are, take their archaeological remains seriously um, uh, uh, you know so there's all these kinds of different careers that you can take in archaeology but the most 99% uh, of archaeology is done um, I can't actually talk to him I need the, the key uh, is done through these CRM firms so these are uh, incorporated private industry firms they're for-profit or sometimes not-for-profit institutions uh, and um, uh, they hire people with with uh, bachelor's and master's degrees largely and sometimes PhDs in archaeology and they do archaeology in and out every day they produce reports they dig they dig the sites uh, they do the historical research they do the cultural research they do the the um, descendant community outreach and collaborative archaeology stuff they do all that stuff CRM archaeology is uh, is is a huge part of um, you know they do they do all the same stuff that, that I would do in an academic setting and maybe even more in some cases um, that was a little bit embarrassing. So I don't. Oh, that guy is still alive. Why? <laughs> um. So in terms of sort of the 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 ethics and methods of archaeology, there's there's really no difference. Oh, I got him yet. Yeah. Pro tip, that dude turns into a gigantic, horrible monster if you don't kill him really, really fast. <gasps> Oops. It happens. This is what I get. I got ahead of myself. All right. <laughs> Last thing I really want to talk about, and then maybe we'll just play the game for a little bit before we quit for the night, is, um, is um, um, about why Dark Souls, and Dark Souls 3 maybe especially, is a, a great uh, video game to talk about archaeology. And it has to do with the way, that, and this is something, I, I'm going to do a whole scripted video about this eventually. Um, so, um, I don't think that thing has, if it had a sharp, I would do it. Um, let's see if I can actually get this down. So I'm going to concentrate for just a second, because I'd like to see if I can. Oh, raw gem. I don't care about that. I thought maybe that had a sharp gem, which is what I really need. Um, 
Uh, so why are these games great games to talk about archaeology? And I talk about this a little bit in the, some of the videos I've already made, but I need to get a little bit uh, I need to get a little bit more serious about it. Because I want to, this, this will serve as like a little bit of an introduction to what will be a future video, uh, which will be focused um, on uh, um, on uh, uh, this very specific thing, the idea of palimpsest. And the way that um, Dark Souls is a very, the Soulsborne games in general, are a very material they have a very material approach to telling history. These games are very interested in history and of describing history or their fan this sort of fantastical history, um, and uh, and they but they do it in a really material way. So think about most other games that that talk about history. I'm thinking like I don't know everything from like Fallout to um, to Uncharted to Tomb Raider. They t they tell history in text. Now that makes sense because that's what history is, right? History is um, people write stuff down, and then you know we find those writings years later, and we interpret them, and we think about them. I'm gonna probably just like not mess with this guy too much because he's just gonna he's just gonna he's gonna kill me. I'm not well prepared for fighting these huge knights yet. Um, and um um. Uh, so they use text to do that, right? You literally find like scraps of paper or computer entries, and those have uh, information in them that you can use to try and recreate. Oh, this is such a. I'm gonna probably die. In here. Uh, let's see how we can do this. Um, this is this room always gives me. This room gives me like straight agita. It's like this is just. I honestly think like one of the most difficult level designs in the game. Is this little teeny room right here? This just like it's it's largely because of these goddamn dogs. So maybe I can murder this dog, and that would help. And then this guy here. Oh, there's another dog I forgot, but I need this very badly. And yeah, and I'm dead. That's all right. We're just gonna call that a suicide. That's fine. Now I have the key. <laughs> um. So um, those games use text to tell their history, right? You find a uh, Cyberpunk 2077 does this, uh, Witcher 3, right? So many great games that are interested in giving us a kind of lore story. Again, this was an idea that I, I got from somebody on the on the Goblin Bunker Discord. Um, uh, but it's, it's an idea that I've had kicking around in my head as well. So I don't mind, uh, I don't mind borrowing it a little bit. Um, are you kidding me? And um, um, so they, so instead of text, of course, the Soul series uses materials to tell their stories, which is really interesting, right? You find things in this game. Oh, I see what I need to do. That's all right. Let's just keep moving forward. Um, are you kidding me? Oh, no, it is down here. That's right. I'm getting lazy and I'm, I'm going to pay the price. Yeah. Oh, I can't believe I'm gonna make it out of this alive. Oh, I'm so lucky. That was that was. You know what? I stayed cool. I had a level head, and now I'm gonna die now instead. Why does this guy have so much health? Oh, I forgot about that, dude. There we go. Crikey! That was challenging. I just want to get down here and I'm like Grey Rat out. This is my boy. This is a good boy, Grey Rat. Um, let's do like Grey Rat say his thing, and then I'll. Yeah, we're gonna skip his stuff and just let him go. Thanks. Yeah, dude. That's cool. Sure. Okay. We'll equip it because why not? Um. <laughs> anyway, um. So, Dark Souls. Now that we've got everybody gone, right? We can actually. I can give you an example of this. Let's go into our items and take a little look around. Um. Dark Souls uses items to tell their stories, and environmental storytelling, right? So if we open up. 
uh, uh, an item, right? This is the blue tear stone ring, which Grey Rat just gave me. A ring set with a large rare tear stone jewel. Temporarily boosts damage absorption when HP is low. This stone is said to be a tear of sorrow of the goddess Katha. And of course, tears are always more beautiful near death, right? So this beautiful little bit of storytelling in this thing. And that's it. That's all it gives us. There's more questions than answers here, right? Who is this goddess? Uh, and and um, um, why is she sorrowful and crying? And, and why are her tears turning into this stone that gives us this like little mild magical effect? Um, uh, and there's so many items. like the, Every single item uh, has this, right? So it gets this so early in the game. A lot of these kind of basic weapons and things don't, don't have good a lot of stories with them. Maybe the cell swords do. I bet they do. Um... Paired scimitars used by certain cell swords. The scimitar sharp blades make for effective slashing attacks, but fare poorly against metal armor and tough scaled uh, covered hides. With a scimitar in each hand, the wielder can vary their answers. So this is a little more descriptive, right? But so many of the items in these games are just full. Um, oh, here's a great one, right? There's no shortage of brass thieves in Lothric. And these particular thieves likely scaled the wall from the undead settlement. But they're only willing to practice their thievery on the high wall, for their fear of Lothric Castle, rumored to devour men, keeps them clear of its grounds. Now, if you've played this game and you know the whole story, there's actually a ton of information in this description of this little key that I just used, right? It actually tells us a lot about Grey Rat, because it actually tells us where he comes from, how he got here, who he is. But it also tells us a lot about the relationship between the High Wall and Lothric Castle, which is a part of the game we're not going to get to for many, many hours. So this is what I mean by this is a very material storytelling sort of a game. The game tells stories in two ways, so far as I can tell. Through these item descriptions, you find items and they have text associated with them. But what is this text, right? This isn't written on the key. It's like ethereally associated with the key. It's like it's like a memory associated with the key, or it's a knowledge that perhaps our player character has and is and is narrating for us. I don't know. It's mysterious, right? Um, and then the other way it tells stories is in envi quote unquote environmental storytelling, which is where these items actually are, where they fall, the dead bodies we come across, the 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 architecture and uh, and level design itself informs the storytelling. We call that environmental storytelling. Or I shouldn't say we. That's what game developers call it. I'm not a game developer, uh, uh, obviously. Um, but that's really cool. And the reason why I'm attracted to that as an archaeologist is because that's how archaeologists tell stories. Pretty much exactly, right? We have materials, artifacts, and we have environmental storytelling, which is context. Um, that's pretty much the way that we reconstruct the past. So the, the, the storytellers at FromSoft who write these games are, are, are telling their history like an archaeologist tells history, as opposed to how a historian tells history. There's nothing wrong with how a historian does it. There's nothing wrong with the way that the story is told in, um, in, in the Fallout games. I mean, that's, it's great. It's really cool and creepy and funny, and right. they do all kinds of great stuff with that, but very much like a historian does it. These are wonderful games to approach with an archaeological mindset. And obviously, if you don't if you don't follow the kind of if you follow the world of Dark Souls, you know who Vadi is and you know the channel Vadi Vidya. And and he's like, you know, maybe the preeminent storyteller in the Dark Souls analysis universe. And I apologize, I'm talking out of my depth. Maybe there's better people out there, but he's the guy I've always I've always checked out. And and he does this where he uses the environmental storytelling and these and these item descriptions and he puts all that information together to tell these stories of the game and lots of many other people are doing that too. Um, he's maybe the most famous, but so many people are doing this kind of work of reconstructing these really complicated lores and worlds, and it's extremely it's extremely cool how they do it. Um, so that's what draws me to these games as an archaeologist. It's why I keep coming back to them. The very first, I mean, the very first video I made for this channel was about Dark Souls. And that was not a coincidence. I picked that because um, because uh, it's just a, like a fascinating way to approach and think about. I could still I could still change to a, to a strength weapon. I could do it. What, what is my, I'm just kidding. I'm like already kind of annoyed of this dexterity build. Like I just want, I just want like a big old sword that I can smash stuff with. Um, I might still, I might still do it. Who knows? We'll see. Um, and, uh, and then I could just, uh, those, those dex levels won't go to waste. 
a level 16 dex is like what I would need to hold a big ultra great sword anyway, so that's fine. Um, we could talk about stats anytime you want. Oh boy, I'll have fun doing that. Uh, these games are just just full of stats. So it's not a coincidence that the very first game that I decided to look at, when I had first had the idea of, of doing this channel, I was thinking about Dark Souls. I was thinking about the thing I just described, right? This this storytelling that they do that's so reminiscent to me of the way that archaeologists build narratives about the past. Uh, and um, I'm going to basically stop here. I've been going for oh, God, 50 minutes, um, which is which is a good long time. And uh, and and and. So the last thing I'll say is there's a reason that I was so drawn to these games in, in the first place. And I know I'm going to come back to them a couple of times. I'd like to do a, a video about Dark Souls 2 because it's my favorite series. My favorite in the series. Um, I might do a video about Dark Souls 3 that would be very specifically about that palimpsest thing, right? Because when we get later in the game, we're going to see. Maybe I won't because maybe I'll just talk. If I end up doing this and we play through the game like this, then I, you know, we'll talk about that a lot. And that's okay. Um, um, but I want to do, I want to, I want to use a, a, do a slightly different approach to talking about Dark Souls 2. So I'm going to come back to this series again and again, but as you can see, obviously, I'm also going to talk about lots of other games. And so I'm not just going to do nothing but this. All right. So it's been over 50 minutes. That's a pretty good long time. That was actually kind of a lot of fun. Uh, I had fun anyway, and I really, I really can just talk for ever <laughs> if you let me. And if people give me some prompts ahead of time, I will fill an hour with bullshit if you let me. Uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, give me some feedback uh, in the comments or wherever, however you can get a hold of me. If if this was cool, if this was fun, if it's something you want to do more of, I'd be happy to do it. If not, and it's not that interesting, you know, I don't. I, maybe I won't. And I can I can focus my energies on um on doing the more scripted stuff. Although also doing these does not detract from my ability to do scripted videos because. This is uh, this is not really work. I'm just playing the game and just and just uh, and just chatting. In the future, I'd like to maybe do this more as uh, as live streams if people are interested in doing that, and then I can interact with people. People can ask me questions on the fly. That would be a lot of fun. So um, I don't quite have the YouTube live stream set up so so much yet. But anyway, thank you so much for hanging out for uh, for listening. Uh, uh, share this around with anybody you think might be interested. Check out some of the scripted videos, uh, which are much more um, structured than this uh, and a very different feel, very different vibe than this. So uh, give those a try if you haven't yet. And have a great night, everybody.